We're all familiar with the passion of anger, at least since the age of two, or if you have a two-year-old, you know what anger is. There's probably nobody in here that at some point in their life hasn't been angry at someone or had certainly had someone angry at them. But beyond being something that we have to deal with on an individual basis, anger really today has become a veritable uh, staple of modern society. Entire movements thrive on and encourage anger to motivate, to motivate and sustain them. You only have to turn on the news anytime to see crowds of angry people shouting, screaming, rioting, looting, burning, all out of anger at some injustice or whether it's real or perceived. When we open practically any magazine or browse the bookstore shelves, we see all kinds of articles and books about anger such as articles like, Mad as Hell, The Power of Women's Rage. Or go to the bookstore, you'll find books like, Rage Becomes Her, The Power of Anger. Good and Mad, The Revolutionary Power of Anger. Love and Rage, of all things, The Path of Liberation Through Anger. And even Use Your Anger, A Woman's Guide to Empowerment. All of these books are about anger and how to use it positively. You could probably name a lot more. Anger has become a convenient tool of many modern social movements, sometimes even of religion itself, and sadly, sometimes even of Christianity. So our goal tonight is to look at what Scripture and the Church have to tell us about anger. Is it ever appropriate? Are we to participate in societal anger? How do we overcome the negative aspects of anger? Those are the things we want to look at. At the very beginning, though, I want to make a confession to you, and that is that most of what I'm going to be saying tonight is not really mine. Uh, these notes, lecture notes, are based on a series of lectures that Father Theodore Puccini gave in Alhambra, California, back in 2019. He gave a series of five lectures, uh, with five hours worth of material that you can listen to if you want to go online and do it. And I've added a few notes of my own, but most of the stuff is his. If you have the time, uh, if you have the luxury of a few hours to listen, uh, there's the, the handout on the last page. There's a URL where you can go and actually download and listen to the lectures. And I encourage you to do it if you have the time. But the reason Father asked me to present this is sort of a condensed version, trying to get in about 45 minutes, what it took him five hours to do. So this will only be a condensed version and very short by comparison. We want to start by looking at anger in Scripture. How, do we, how does Scripture talk about anger? What we're going to see is an evolution of thought about anger. But I don't want you to mis misunderstand what I mean by saying an evolution of thought. Many things in Scripture can be seen to evolve in similar ways. Not because God changes or the Word of God evolves, but because of man's understanding of it. As God reveals more and more of himself and of his will, we see an evolutionary, an evolution of understanding. As an example, we see in Scripture an evolution of the understanding of the very nature of God himself. He continually reveals more of himself to mankind throughout history. In early Hebrew history, God was perceived more anthropomorphically, than, similar to how the surrounding pagan societies viewed their gods. But over time, he's revealed more and more through the prophets, and a fuller and deeper comprehension of God takes place. Finally, he's revealed most fully in the Incarnation. God became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, does this mean that God has changed over time? Certainly not. Malachi tells us, I am the Lord, I do not change. And in a similar fashion, we see the understanding of man changing. The Jews' view of other things changed as well. They began to learn more, they matured. God himself doesn't change, nor does his word become altered. But our understanding does. To help us see this more clearly, think about the attitudes that uh, man has had toward marriage over time. In early Hebrew history, polygamy was an accepted practice. God never ordained it. He never prescribed it. But it was allowed. Abraham himself had three wives. Jacob had four. King David had at least eight. Solomon had 
famously had 700. But by the time of the Babylonian uh, captivity, <coughs> around the 6th century BC, monogamy was now the norm. And later, Christ himself revealed that monogamy was God's choice or design from the very beginning. That's how marriage was supposed to be. Marriage was more than a simple uh, contract between people. It wasn't arranged thing. It was something spiritual. It was something sacramental. Starting with the time of the patriarchs, through Moses and the prophets, and then at last to Christ himself, we see a growing understanding of marriage develop as God reveals more of his will to mankind. And that's the evolution of thought we're talking about when we're discussing anger. Because we see the same thing happening with anger. The biblical view of anger evolves as God's original will and intent become clearer throughout history, especially as mankind's understanding of God's nature becomes more developed and more refined. Recall that in the early period, God was seen as very human-like, much as the pagan gods were perceived by Israel's neighbors back then. Anthropomorphic depictions of God are found in the Old Testament, but we certainly recognize that they're not literal. But the perceptions of God in early Hebrew history show that the ancients were influenced in the thinking about God by the pagan societies around them, how they thought about their gods. They tended to see God in much the same way. They were beings of great power, but really not much different from ourselves. They could be capricious. They could be offended. They could become angry. They could be mollified by flattery. They were subject to human emotions. But over time, we see a maturation of the Israelite understanding of God. The God we see in later Hebrew history is rather different from the one that we see in ancient Hebrew history. Again, that doesn't mean God had changed, but the man's understanding had deepened. It had become fuller. It had become more mature. In early Hebrew history, when the Jews still thought of God in human terms, he was felt to have the same passions as humans. And his divine wrath was on par with that of pagan gods, so it was believed to be justified. And because God could be angry, it was assumed that it was natural for man to express righteous anger, believing he was reflecting the anger of God. You might look for an example of the um, incident of Jehu in 4th Kingdoms chapter 10, or 2nd Kings if you're using the Protestant Bible, 2nd Kings chapter 10. Remember that Jehu had overthrown the evil king Ahab. And he was righteously angry with all the things that Ahab had done to lead Israel away from God. After he killed Ahab and Jezebel, there were still 70 sons of Ahab who lived in Jezreel. In his righteous anger, Jehu orders that all 70 sons be beheaded, believing that he possessed the righteousness of God. It was justified because God must have been angry at Jehu and his sons. And so he felt he would reflect that righteousness by being angry himself and taking vengeance on the 70 sons of, of Ahab. But note that this happened in the 9th century B.C. But when we see the same event referenced a century later, 8th century B.C., in the book of Hosea, the Lord states, I will avenge the blood of Jezreel in the house of Jehu, and I will make to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. Jehu had believed that his anger was the anger of God. But he failed to understand God's true nature, something we learn much later, like in 2 Peter 3.9. God's will is for man to come to repentance, not to be destroyed. But Jehu <coughs> perceived his anger as righteous anger. That he was, it was actually the anger of God, and he had not drawn a line between divine and human anger. So, while early on, anger was viewed in Scripture as a perfectly legitimate response to injury, we find as we read through history that it later becomes suspect. Something that may perhaps be acceptable on certain occasions, but definitely not something that should be unbridled or without constraint. Instead, we, we begin seeing anger accepted as a human natural emotion, and instead of that, we begin to see a growing suspicion of anger. This is found primarily in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, though it's also in the prophets. The book of Proverbs is quite replete with uh, comments about anger and suspicion of anger. Proverbs 15 says, A wrathful man stirs up strife, 
but he who is slow to anger allays contention. Also in Proverbs, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And again, wrath is cruel and anger a sorrow. In Psalm 37, 36, in, in the Septuagint, cease from anger, turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. Even in Jonah, like Hosea, 8th century, in Jonah we see a growing suspicion of anger and a changing attitude towards what's considered righteous <coughs> anger. In Jonah 4, Jonah is angry because what he want, expected to happen if he preached to the Ninevites is exactly what happened. He was afraid if he wouldn't preach to them, they would repent and God wouldn't destroy them. That's what happened. He preached to them. They repented. God did not destroy them. And he was angry because he wanted God to destroy them. He felt that that was God's righteous anger. But God chastises him for his anger. And he says, Shall I myself not take pity on Nineveh, the great city in which dwell more than 120,000 people who do not know either the right hand from the left and many livestock? God's concern was even for the animals in the city. Later in the wisdom literature of the Deuterocanonical books, we see anger becoming even more suspect, to the point that the wisdom of Sirach says that anger is an impediment to applying the will of God. Not only does it not reflect the will of God, it's an impediment to it. Sirach chapter 27 says, Anger and wrath, these are also abominations, and a sinful man shall possess both. He who seeks revenge will find it from the Lord, and he will surely punish his sin. Forgive a wrong done you by your neighbor, then your sins will be pardoned when you pray. Can a man preserve wrath against his neighbor and still seek healing from the Lord? Remember the end of your life and cease enmity. Do not vent your wrath against your neighbor. As we move then into the New Testament, we find yet further development further evolution of attitudes towards anger. Christ warns us that whenever whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be danger of the judgment, in Matthew 5. And by the time of the epistles, we're told to eliminate anger from our lives entirely. <clears throat> Ephesians 4.31 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, which is loud quarreling, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Similarly in Colossians 3.8, But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. And St. James tells us in the first chapter of his epistle, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now compare that to what we thought about Anger in early <coughs> Hebrew history. Wrath and anger reflected the anger and wrath of God. St. James tells us that it does not produce the righteousness of God. Just the opposite. Let's look at these verses in some detail. First, note that there are two primary words in the New Testament that are translated as anger or wrath. And I do not speak Greek, so if, if any Greek speakers here are offended, Please forgive me. Don't be angry with me, please, uh, if I mispronounce them. But orge and themos. Themos is a sudden, violent outburst of anger, something that boils up quickly. You, you might think of road rage, for example, as an example of themos. Orge, on the other hand, is an established or entrenched anger, the kind of long-seated anger that plots revenge. When we look at the verses we just referenced, we'll note that they contain both orge and themos. We're to eliminate both types of anger from our lives, and even some other attitudes that can lead to anger. The Ephesians 4 passage lists six things that we're to put away. First is bitterness, sakriya, long-standing resentment or brooding grudges, wrath, themos, that's where it mentions themos, that explosive anger or sudden outbreak of fury, anger, orge, deep-seated anger, describing someone who's always mad at something. <clears throat> Clamor, crowding, shouting and yelling, especially in anger. Evil speaking, blasphemia, angry insults, verbal abuse, and malice, takia. Ill will towards others, readiness to think the worst of someone. 
And St. Paul doesn't just leave us empty. He doesn't give us a laundry list of things to get, rid of, get out of our lives and leave a gap. He says you're to fill that gap with these things. Kindness, tenderheartedness, and forgiveness. Kindness, caring for others' well-being and looking for ways to help. Tenderheartedness, compassion, a heart that goes out to others. And forgiveness, forgiving as God forgives us. And it's in this way, he says, that we will be imitators of God. Wrath does not reflect the righteousness of God. These things do. Kindness, tenderheartedness, and forgiveness. In Colossians 3.8, Paul lists almost exactly the same things as he does in Ephesians, things that are to be eliminated <coughs> from our lives. Here we find them in a slightly different order, and while he does not mention patria or kraoge, he includes uh, filthy language or vulgar talk. I don't even try to pronounce the Greek word. He instructs us to put off these things. None of these things, he says, are to come out of our mouths, but are to be, once and for all, put off as though putting off old clothing. We are to put off the old man. We are to be clothed anew in righteousness, clothed in Christ. It's not possible for us to continue in our old behavior and with evil and malicious speaking because mouths which utter Eucharistic praise to God can't also utter these things. St. James likewise encourages us to divest ourselves of anger. Or he uses the word orgy. And he shows the utter, his utter compatibility with God in this, and stating that the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So what did the early fathers say? That's what scripture has to say about anger. What did the early fathers have to say? Actually, they had quite a lot to say about anger. For one, they believed that when man was created, he was made in the image of God and was made to be in full communion with him. That was our created nature. And because of this, they believed that anger, or as they often refer to it, insensitive power, anger wasn't originally a part of man. As St. Gregory of Sinai wrote, when God, through his life-giving breath, created the soul, he did not implant in it anger and desire that are animal-like. Similarly, when God formed the body, he did not originally implant in it uh, instinctual anger and desire. It was only afterward, through the fall, that it was invested with these characteristics. So what he's saying is that man was not originally created for the kind of tension in the soul that we now experience. Instead, when we were created, the body was free from corruption, and being in the image of God, the soul was dispassionate. It didn't possess insensitive power. Such as to say, anger was not planted in the soul originally. Instead, it's one of the results of the fall and is a power that in fact restricts nearness to God rather than enhances it. It's a part of our fallen nature. So where then did anger come from? What causes anger? You said it's part of our fallen nature. Well, Father Theodore uh, Polcini, really going to his uh, lectures now, he put forward that the fathers named eight specific things that provoke anger. It can be found in the fathers. The first is the appetite of the soul. Evagrius Ponticus said, if you are arm yourself against anger, you will never succumb to any kind of desire. Desire provides the, the uh, fuel for anger. And is desire not the fruit of pride? Making oneself the center rather than focusing on Christ and the welfare of others. The appetite of the soul, desiring something for ourselves, that can lead to anger. It's one of the fuels of anger. The second is vainglory, or conceit. This is otherwise known as sensitivity to insult. The insult actually is a great gauge <coughs> as to how conceited or prideful a person is. Patriarch Kirill of Moscow said, As with the majority of vices, anger grows out of human pride. A proud man who places himself in the very center of life develops a sense of, sense of self-confidence. Self-confidence asserts itself more and more in one's proud attitude to the surrounding world. And if someone says or does something to the proud man that he does not agree with, he takes this as a challenge to his sense of I, which is the most important and central thing in the world to him. Hence arises this dreadful emotion accompanied by raised voices, 
angry words and terrible facial expressions. With the force of his words and facial expressions, this person attempts to strike a blow against those who dare to disagree with him. The sad thing is, that's what we teach our children in school. We teach them that you are the center of the universe. You are to engage the world and stand up for yourself. We dress it in the terms of self-esteem, but often we're only teaching pride. And we convey the idea that any infringement of that pride brings justifiable anger. But in reality, it brings only anger. Vainglory or conceit is a sure and certain path to anger. A third thing that the fathers mention is fault-finding in others. St. Paisius has written, the course of anger is your belief that it's always the other person who is at fault. The anger in you begins with the negative thoughts you have for another. Once more, we can attribute this to pride. Even when we may concede a fault within ourselves, which most of us are allowed to grow, which most of us don't want to do, how often do we then go on to find even greater fault in others or attribute the fault in ourselves being caused by somebody else. As St. Ambrose says, no one heals himself by wounding others. Yet this is what we often do by finding fault in our brother. A fourth is overloading. Now, we tend to think of this as a problem of modern society, taking on too much on ourselves, working too hard, and assuming more than a reasonable amount of responsibility. But it's actually been a problem for all of human history. Again, quoting from St. Paisius, even the most patient donkey will kick when he's been overloaded. It's also true that certain professions, he says, not only harm the soul's well-being, but they can even turn the naturally calm person into a nervous wreck. Overloading ourselves, even with the best of intentions, can have the result of leading to anger, so we have to be wary of that. A fifth is lack of self-attentiveness. And this follows almost directly from overloading. And we avoid overloading with the admonition to observe more self-attentiveness. St. John Cassian writes, The Lord's intention is that we should remove the root of anger in whatever way we can, and not keep even a single pretext for anger in our hearts. Otherwise, we will be stirred to anger initially for what appears to be a good reason, and then find that our insensitive power is totally out of control. We have to be aware of what's going on inside ourselves at all times. And a sixth point that they make, origin of anger, and here I'm really stepping on my toes, stepping on a lot of toes probably, but my own more than any, is remembrance of wrong. St. John Cassian said, wrath is a reminder of hidden hatred, that is to say, remembrance of wrongs. It deliberately cultivates anger. Remembrance of wrong fuels anger hidden hatred, and it's something I myself am very guilty of, and I'm sure most of us have to battle that. The seventh is contention and argumentativeness. Some people will invariably take exception to anything you say. Most likely it's because they have some kind of hidden anger towards you. And eighth is malediction and invective and invectiveness, curses expressing hostile feelings. St. John Cassian said, It is bad to disturb the eye of a soul by anger, but it is still worse to show in words the anger of the soul. Man has such powers that he can transmit good or evil through his environment. Even a simple glance or a sigh can influence people around us. And even the slightest anger can do harm. When we speak evil about someone, the evil power proceeds from within us and is transmitted to the other person. It's something like the bewitching it's something like the bewitchment of the evil eye. Elder Porphyrius wrote in Wounded by Love, When we speak evil about someone, an evil power proceeds from within us and is transmitted to the other person, just as the voice is transmitted in sound waves. And in point of fact, the other person suffers evil. It's something like the bewitchment of the evil eye, he said, when someone has evil thoughts about others. This occurs through our own indignation. We transmit our evil in a mystical way. 
going to take a little bit of a rabbit trail here and talk a bit about the evil eye. What is the evil eye? The wisdom of Sirach says that the evil eye is a bad thing, so what is it? It's something that for most of modern most modern people don't believe exists. As enlightened people, we understand only the intromission uh, theory of sight, that energy enters in through the eye. But the ancients held also to the extramission theory of sight, that energy can proceed outward from the eye. Even though our modern scientific thinking uh, rejects the idea of extramissional sight, nearly all of us have experienced it on an existential level. Why did you look at me like that? I can tell you're upset with me by the way you look at me. <coughs> don't look at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. Did you notice his condescending look? She just shot daggers at me. We know that these things happen. Look at Matthew 6, verses 22 and 23. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? The Semitic understanding of this would be not merely the intramissional, but also the extramissional aspect of the eye. When we possess the evil eye, the darkness in you comes out through the eye. There's in fact an energy that can come out of the eyes and it's transmitted to other people, even though it may not be something we can measure scientifically. If we're filled with anger, that darkness within us can be transmitted to others just by the way we look at them. Think about some of the examples of people, angry people you've seen on the internet. You can see these pictures. You don't know what the context is. You don't know what might be going on. There's no audio. There's no caption to tell you what's happening. No words. But you can tell by the expression, these people are angry. Tremendously angry. St. John of Kronstadt said, Malice or any other passion that has taken root in your heart has a tendency in accordance with the infallible law of evil to discharge itself outwardly. Such as to say, you can't keep evil in. It will be discharged one way or the other. But moving on, the next question the fathers asked was, can anger ever be a good thing? That's one of the questions they often struggled with. You might want to read the article, The Good Anger, it's in your handout. It's by Father... Stephen Freeman. <coughs> In this question, the early fathers were divided. Among some, they believed, like Saint, uh, Saints Isaiah, the Solitary, Maximus the Confessor, and Gregory of Sinai, they believed that there could be righteous anger, justifiable anger. But others, such as John Cassian, was among those who held the opposite view, that anger is never justified, held to. He believed that we should get rid of all anger, based on Ephesians 4.31. So the question the fathers asked was whether anger is good or bad. And their answer to that was yes. Daniel Dombrowski published an essay on anger in the Kilkalia in Mystical Quarterly back in 1998, where he observed that, and I'm quoting him here, there is something senseless about anger in that it ravages, darkens, and confuses the soul. Indeed, it seems the best advice is to dry up the passion of anger and cast it into the fire. All right, that's easier said than done. How do we accomplish this? Once more, Father Theodore outlined six steps that he found in the Fathers to advise in the therapy of anger. The very first one is to shut up. Be silent. Joseph the Hesychast wrote, When anger comes, close your mouth tightly, and do not speak to him who curses, dishonors, reproaches, or bothers you in any way without reason. Then this snake will writhe the rent in your heart, rise up in your throat, and since you don't give it a way out, it will choke and suffocate you. How many times has anger stirred up in life by a hastily spoken word? As St. James instructs us, we're to be quick to hear, but slow to speak. Rather than giving a hasty retort, we should keep silent, remembering that you cannot unsay something, just as unfortunately you cannot unhear Yoko Ono. You cannot unsay harsh words, <coughs> and though they may be forgiven, the harm done by those words always lingers. 
St. Leodicus, a thought of key, wrote, When the soul's in sense of power is lost, there is no righteous anger except that which is directed within oneself, that is, toward the evil within oneself, toward the old man, or the former you. In other words, anger is constructive only when it's properly directed. If we wish to be angry in a healthy manner, he says we are to be angry with ourselves and with the evil suggestions within us. To quote Father Theodore, the only justifiable anger is that directed against the evil in oneself. According to St. John Cassian, anger that is directed against others, no matter how evil they are, is utterly proscribed. Now, this doesn't mean that St. Cassian was oblivious to the evil in others, but he's giving advice on how to conquer the temptation to direct our frustration at others, which ironically is exactly the opposite of what we're encouraged to do today. Modern psychology tells us that St. Cassian's advice is unhealthy. It tells us that anger directed inward can become depression, and that getting angry with oneself can potentially complicate rather than remedy the problem. And this is worth noting, that we have to be careful how we understand being angry and having anger toward, turn toward in on oneself. We have to recognize that it's the evil suggestion within us. It's the demon suggesting the evil that we should be angry and direct our anger toward, not a, dimension, not a diminishing of our own worth in the eyes of God. It's the old man, our former self, that was in league with the demons on which we are to focus our anger while we seek to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. This is what the fathers meant by turning our anger inward, being angry with the evil within us. <coughs> we, have, we must not forget that we are always in a process of transformation. Orthodox soteriology is not a once and done proposition. We don't simply do one act and poof, the old man is gone. We are constantly in a process of transformation. We call it theosis. Always living inside of us is the old man, the former self, the one that we were before we began our transformation. <coughs> this old man doesn't disappear in an instant, so we have to learn that instead of turning our anger in, on, into ourselves in a generic sense, we turn it instead specifically against this old man within us, that former self that keeps trying to come out and doesn't want us to transform. We do have a right to be angry with that person because he's still living inside us and he's still constantly struggling to come out. A third step in the therapy of anger is what Theodore, Father Theodore finds in the Fathers. He calls the anticipatory imaginative approach, which they don't use that term. St. Deodicus said, that what we should do is visualize the person who is angry with us with an overflow of compassion in our soul and so fulfill the law of love in the depths <coughs> of our heart. Visualization. Now, how do we do this? When someone is angry with us, we should visualize that person standing next to us or in front of us as we pray. St. Neela said, prayer is the seed of gentleness in the absence of anger. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to be angry with someone when you're praying for them? And as you visualize this person standing beside you or in front of you, we see them as someone to whom we are to show compassion and the embrace of brotherhood. If we do this, then the next time we meet that person, the hostile feeling will be at least tempered by what we visualize. This is also an exercise modern-day therapists have adopted because it's highly effective. They think they've discovered something new, but it's in the fathers. When you don't have a good relationship with someone, visualize being in a good relationship with them. And this isn't just pop psychology. It's the advice of the fathers. A fourth step is to recognize that rational control is not enough. Intellectualism insists that the insensitive power of the soul can be controlled by the rational mind. But the fathers teach us that the rational power of the soul is insufficient by itself. Rather, it has to be empowered and guided by the Holy Spirit. St. John Cassian affirms this by saying, For it is impossible for a man to win a triumph over any kind of passion unless he has first clearly understood that he cannot possibly gain the victory in the struggle with it by his own strength and efforts. Step five in Theodore's, Father Theodore's 
this is to use the Psalms. St. Basil the Great said of the Psalms, A psalm implies serenity of soul. It is the author of peace which calms the bewildering and seething thoughts. For it softens the wrath of the soul, and what is unbridled it chastens. A psalm forms friendship, unites those separated, conciliates those at enmity. I think it's worth noting that candidates in earlier times, candidates for the bishopric, were expected to know all the psalms from memory. So much aid can be found in the psalms to deal with a multitude of life's challenges, including and especially anger. And for these, Father Theodore recommends especially the imprecatory psalms. They're enumerated on the handout. Each of these consists of three main parts. First, the psalmist is angry. He's vent. He's vent because he's either angry or upset. He surrenders judgment to God, and then he affirms the righteousness of God. And finally, step six is to reassess and reaffirm our commitment to the gospel of Christ. This means simply that we should make sure that our mind and heart are aligned with Christ. Is our gospel the gospel of Christ, or is it of our own making? Are we following the teachings of Christ or the ideologies of our day? Does our understanding of the life and teachings of Christ conform to the teachings and morality of the church? And that leads us to the question, does anger affect our furthering the gospel of Christ? Does it affect our efforts to bring others to him? Father Theodore gives us an example of how it, yes, it does. He formerly taught a university class in which one of the assignments he gave was for each of his students to attend a religious service not of their own faith and then write a paper about it. In one of his classes, he had a student who was an atheist who asked to be exempted from this assignment, but he didn't get out of it. So uh, the student chose to attend a local revival that was going on at a stadium nearby. And after attending the service, he wrote in his paper, and I'm quoting the student here, these people sitting around me all seemed angry about something. Under all the talk about truth and love and righteousness, there was a current of anger that was always sweeping the people away. They were most enthusiastic when they were angry. And he says, that is why I am not a religious person. Whenever I went to church or talked to committed Christians of whatever stripe, the anger was always there, like endless fuel powering the engine. So we have to ask, are we exhibiting anger in our lives, or are we exhibiting Christ? Is anger distorting our process of evangelization? One of the articles in your handout is by Ed Snyder called The Devil's Delight is Angry Religion. Clearly anger, or at least inappropriate or misdirected anger, definitely has a negative impact on our efforts to bring people to Christ. So is it ever appropriate for Christians to express anger? We've mentioned already that it's right to be angry with the old man and ourselves, but what about anger against an unjust process, such as racism or tyranny? But it may be appropriate to be angry at the injustice itself. When anger becomes the main fuel that feeds, feeds the engine, it becomes a destructive force. We have to separate anger from an unjust anger at an unjust cause, which might be justified anger, from anger at retributive causes. That is, when we get angry against someone and begin targeting people that we want to mock and demonize, making them the counterpoint of our own identity. No doubt the early Christians were angry with the injustice that saw them arrested, tortured, persecuted, and executed for their beliefs. They had to be angry about that. But they didn't express that anger, I guess, by being angry with their neighbors. They didn't express it by being angry with their torturers or even the emperors who ordered the persecutions. Instead, as St. Paul instructed them in 1 Timothy 2, they prayed for the emperor. They prayed for all those in authority over them. They prayed for their torturers to be forgiven. Many of their torturers themselves, if you read the lives of the saints, which Father is always encouraging us to do in the reading after the please read the lives of the saints, many of their torturers themselves became Christians, being moved by the examples that these people gave in their courage, love, and forgiveness. Rather than shows of anger, these early Christians demonstrated kindness, 
tenderheartedness and forgiveness. Just as St. Paul instructed. And through that, they won many to Christ. Rather than seeing anger, people should instead see Christ in it. This is immensely important because anger has now become a societal movement. It's a subcultural agenda. And this all misses the personal dimension. It's far easier to talk about societal movement than it is to talk about personal transformation. But what we have to do is to show our culture that if anger is ever to be overcome, if it's ever to be controlled, it won't be by the mechanisms of society at large. It has to be done by the transformation of individuals, beginning with me. We have to engage in the spiritual transformation of the individual. Handling of anger on the macro level, groups, without first dealing with it in the micro level, individuals, is nothing more than social manipulation. We have to continually focus on the personal transformation that we are all called to as a result of our new life in Christ. As St. Seraphim Sarah said, so famously said, acquire the spirit of peace and all the thousands around you will be saved. We cannot address societal anger without first addressing the anger within ourselves, each of us individually acquiring the spirit of peace. So what can we as Orthodox Christians do to overcome this growing scourge of anger in our society? Father Theodore makes what he calls a modest proposal of two points, not eight or six this time, just two. He says, first, serve as personal exemplars, and second, Present the church as a microcosm of a society in which anger's controlling power has been broken. We have to provide an alternative to the culture of anger. We're transformed as individuals, but this has a ripple effect, and it moves from the micro level to the macro level of its own accord. We have to allow ourselves to be transformed for the healing not only of our own souls, but for the healing of all the culture around us. Father, I bring the floor back to you before anyone gets angry with me for taking up more. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I'll point out one thing on the handout. There's also uh, my email address. If you want more detailed quotes, I didn't. I only printed. We think the handout's pretty long, but there are lots of quotes from the fathers. Many of them that I just read portions of, and there are others I didn't read at all. If you would like to have a copy of that, I can send you a PDF by email. Just email me. Thank you.